something could happen in the north, a uh, adventuresome uh, military commander could decide to take over and sue for peace with the south and say, hey, we want to be part of this, not this part of this failed economic system in the north. Annyeonghaseyo. Hello, everyone. This is Mark Peters from the, with the Frog Outside the Well Research Center. And today I have a very special guest. Uh, we've been working on films together off and on since when? 2009, 2009 2010, something for, around there. For over 10 years. This is my good friend, Dodge Billingsley. He is the uh, director, producer uh, at Combat Films and Research. Yes. Uh, and we did a film together well, he did it. I just helped, really, on the <laughs> side, right? You did it. That's being modest. Uh, but we did a film in Korea uh, back in 2009, you say, titled Unfortunate Brothers. Yeah. And it was a very clever title because it's talking about North and South Korea as unfortunate brothers. But it features a refugee from North Korea who was an unfortunate brother because when he got out, he notified his brother that his brother should come out and his brother didn't make it. So it's the story of the two brothers, symbolic of the brothers of North and South Korea was the message of the video. Uh, <laughs> That was a great video. Oh, thanks. Well, I mean, it was an interesting collaboration. It was it fun was, to do. Yeah, it was really fun to do. Yeah. So. Tell me a little bit about your, your background. Uh, combat films. Why combat films? Uh, you know, it's when I first started making documentary film, the first films we did were about war and conflict and at the time i thought i'm going to make this my whole career i'm just going to do war and conflict films uh, i hadn't really thought that through all the way so not every film we've done has been about war and conflict but, the, but there's been a handful so my first film was about chechnya <laughs> Some unfortunate brothers, which we did, it was not about active, you know, ongoing war, but there is a conflict, obviously, unresolved conflict between North and South Korea, North Korea, and the rest of the world. And your specialization, in addition to film, is uh, combat. Is uh... yeah. So I write a lot about military studies, tactical studies. So I've written a couple of books on things in Afghanistan and Chechnya. And your degree is in war from studies. Columbia in Columbia University in war study. Well. It's my degree actually, as it hangs on the wall, is a peace studies focus out of the history department. And I asked him why it was peace studies when basically it was a war studies degree and they said, well, we don't really have a war studies thing going on here, but it was a study of war and conflict. And then you went on and got a master's degree in? <clears throat> I got a master's degree in war studies from King's College Department of War Studies in London. So you're a real specialist on combat. You've never been in the army. No, but prior to 9-11, I'd probably seen more combat than most American service members, except maybe special operations. You've done a lot of embeds. I've done a lot of embeds, yeah, with uh, US forces going into Iraq multiple times in Afghanistan. Uh, with the Brazilian army in the Amazon. So you've done a lot of combat films, but you've branched out into other more political. Well, kind of yeah, just international relations type film. Yeah. So we did a film about art along the Swahili coast for the Smithsonian wow. Museum, which was really interesting. One of the first ones I knew about was Helen Foster Snow. We did, yeah, film about Helen Foster. A China specialist and mm -hmm. uh, who had Utah connections. Right, yeah. and her role sort of um, exposing, or not exposing, but introducing Mao Zedong to the rest of the world. So you did the China thing. What got mm -hmm. you involved with Korea? So. We've done a lot of work with the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies at Brigham Young University. And Eric Heyer, my good friend. And Professor Heyer. 
uh, who was a China specialist. So we were in New York City together. He was doing a graduate degree at Columbia. And I was doing my undergraduate at Columbia. Oh, you go back to there. So we met in like the mid 80s, mid to late 80s. And then we reconnected on Helen Foster Snow. When I was asked to do the Helen Foster Snow film for the university, they said, you're going to work with a professor, Eric Heyer. I go, oh, I know Eric, you know, but oh. I had, it had been, we'd kind of lost contact. Oh, so really? It was kind of nice to reconnect. And so we spent the next couple of years working on that film. And, and he's a borders guy, China well, borders guy. Among his other specialties you, are China. Yeah, China he took border. you up to the China-Korea border. Yeah, we wanted to go and check out this border uh, along the North Korea, the Tumen River side of the North Korea-China border. And that's what got you interested in Korea a little bit? Um, I mean, I was always interested in the North Korea question as someone who graduated two degrees in war studies, you can't ignore North Korea. So, I mean, I was into, interested in that, of course, but I, I can many, I think in all experiences, once you get on the ground, you actually can walk some of the territory that you're discussing in the textbook. You gain some anecdotal insight, I think, you know, like, oh, I've been there, I felt this way, or I, you know, like I, and again, I was super shocked about, there's one stretch of the Tumen River where the border fence you know, international boundaries are supposed to go right down the middle of a major river or waterway, right? But the boundary fence was on the Chinese side. Oh. And North Korean patrol right up to the Chinese side, like they walked the fence, like right there on the China side. North Korea's on the China side? Yeah, of the river. Oh, really? Could walk the fence, apparently. Uh, and um, we talked to some locals there and they talked about that. And then watching like Chinese, like they would, it was forti not fortified, it was militarized. But not really. It was pretty low key. There were Chinese units, but it's clear that North Korea wasn't a threat to them. They weren't militarizing to like the DMZ, you know, which is completely like. Yeah, North Korean cannot escape through the DMZ unless right. they're a soldier, and that only happens rarely. But when a North Korean escapes, they usually go through the Tumen River yep. or the Yalu River, Yalu River into Tumen. China. And as I understand, it's mainly the Tumen because the Tumen is, you know, you can walk across it many times a year, so where the Yalu is deep. Yeah. So it's a different. Yeah, the upper Tumen's rather shallow. Yeah. And in the winter, it's frozen. It's frozen over, so people will walk across. Yeah. It. And there's a lot of stories of people that walk right. across. And then once they get into China, <laughs> to go from North Korea to South Korea, which is basically 60 miles or two miles, you've got to go 3,000 miles through China, through Thailand, and right. back up to South Korea. So you were interested in this uh, one defector that you found. How did, how did you find him? Well, and I actually, it's funny, I don't recall exactly how we found him, but we found lots of defectors. The trouble is, and they'd all talk to us, but none of them would talk to us on camera for fear of exposing family members on the North Korean side. That's always a danger. And so I don't exactly remember why Mr. Lee decided he would talk to us and be on camera. I think, well, I think it's because his whole family was out and, and those who were left had been killed. Yeah. Or died. Yeah. So he was sort of free from some of the restraint. And he was also an activist. He's more of an activist. And so yeah. it was, in a way, it fit his activist profile. I would have liked to have told the story of two or three defectors to see how their lives were working in South Korea. So it wasn't just a one person case study. But again, it was really hard to find somebody who wanted to be on camera. Yeah. Lots of good book material, but not a lot of good film material if you can't show somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a great video. A great documentary and uh well it was great working with you on it because you brought along all the expertise and all your lifetime experience in korea and, well i was more than happy to be discovered to <laughs> help work with that that was a, that was a lot of fun and it's a great video y'all if you get a chance to see the documentary unfortunate brothers uh you want to you want to see it what projects are you working on now uh, we're actually revisiting Korea, uh, but in a different way this time. Uh, there's a Utah National Guard unit that served there in 1951. And, and I'm involved in this one too. This is yes, a lot of fun. Actually, you brought this to us. Yeah. And um, yeah. it's an interesting story. It would have been great to do it 20 years ago when many more of the veterans were still alive, but we've been able to have, meet half a dozen. Yeah, we've and met. We've met. We've Six. interviewed five, and we've got one more on the radar we need yeah. to go interview. And yeah. uh, it's about their story in Korea, which is pretty miraculous. The miraculous story, in a nutshell, is that this Utah unit, with about 350 men, mm -hmm. came out to Korea and fought in a lot of battles, artillery. Artillery's yeah. way back. They don't get 
Yeah, you yeah. don't usually think of them as being a frontline unit. They shouldn't have been a frontline unit, but but they that found night, themselves. one night, a Chinese regiment, they say four thousand, maybe five thousand Chinese, ran into them. I don't think they each knew yeah, the other was exactly. there. Yeah, exactly. It was an accidental battle, but they were shooting not the big guns. Yeah, shooting the little guns, and uh, in the morning they looked and they went out and captured eight hundred and thirty, and they killed three hundred and fifty on the Chinese side. And how many Utah boys got killed? Uh, I don't even think a single Utah boy got wounded. None were killed. And we call this the miracle battle of Kapyung. If you look up Kapyung on Wikipedia, there's a Australian Canadian battle in Kapyung. Yeah. Again with the Chinese that took place the month before. a month before. Yeah. So, but the uh, Utah battle is not well known and we want to get it out there. So yeah, that's that, what we're that would be on. a fun project. So I'll be looking forward to go back up into the DMZ area and go to Kapyong. See ya. Because yeah. we have actually on our trip when we were filming Unfortunate Brothers, we were west of that. We've never yeah. been that far, you know, east along that DMZ. Kapyong is the east of four routes into Seoul. And it's the easternmost route into Seoul. Yeah. And that's where the Utah uh, artillery was stationed right. to keep the Chinese from coming in uh, on that route. Yeah, it'd be really nice, you know, and we've thought about this. I know we've talked about it. Like it was this. Was it the 6th Rock Division or 2nd Rock Division? Uh, maybe exploring to see if we can find any veterans of that who might remember that battle too. I'm looking forward to working with you on this uh, Utah National Guard film. I think it'll be a great story. Yeah, I mean, it's been really fun so far. I mean, we've collected and filmed, I think. Julius here in the office has scanned, not filmed, we've scanned 2,000 photographs, I think. Well, it'll be a great video. I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. Unfortunate Brothers finishes with a balloon launch. Yes. Meaning they're sending socks. Yeah, he was an activist, and, but he believed that North Koreans needed socks and he'd put dollar bills in the socks and... And sent these balloons off. We are now in the most important and 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 most 그 다음에 이제 그 어, 양말이 또 사람 뭐 북한에는 이제 양말이 왜 다른 필수품보다 더 중요한가 하면 그 다음에 이제 그이 양말을 가진 사람들이 한 걸레 가지 있으면 어, 자기 하나 신을 수 있겠다. 그러나 여러 걸레 가진 사람은 이걸 시장에 나, 내다 팔면 돈을 가질 수 있잖아요. 물물 교환도 할수 있고. 그러니까 이 양말이 어, 식량도 될수 있고. 그냥 또 돈도 될수 있는 겁니다. I remember you have my voice on that balloon launch. And I'm saying, this uh, is a hope for unification someday. And the unification could take place before this video is launched, or, or it might take 50 years. Right. You know, the question of unification, it could happen anytime. It could happen by the time this film is aired. Something could happen in the North, a uh, adventuresome, a uh, military commander could decide to take over and sue for peace with the South and say, hey, we want to be part of this, not this part of this failed economic system in the North. That could happen tomorrow. And it could take another 30 or 50 years. It's really hard to say. So, that's the situation with uh, with North Korea, and a great documentary on that. Appreciate it. So I think we'll call it a day here. Okay. Um, good talking to you. Good working with you. And we'll see you next time on the Frog Outside the Well Research Center. Bye.